Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I, I really want to thank uh, Jeffrey and the conference organizers for inviting me here. I'm thrilled to be here, um, not just to sort of you know, share some of my insights, but also to learn and, and take home pearls of wisdom and, uh, uh, and inspiration experience from, from any of you that can part, per, you know, in, impart that on me. Um, I started out as a pediatric GI doctor, uh, I still am, uh, uh, and I, but right now I work at Cedar sinai Medical Center at the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center there, where I actually take care of children and adults. Um, and I just do IBD, so I actually had the uh, fortune of being one of the first doctors to do a specialty program just in inflammatory bowel disease uh, for two years, uh, actually a while back. Um, and then, you know, I think oh, IBD is sort of a subspecialized program, right? So, but a couple of years ago, uh, we decided to embark on sub subspecialty programs. So we have one, for example, for psychosocial stuff, uh, pregnancy issues. Um, we have one for uh, pouch issues. Um, and when we were discussing what to do, when someone brought up the idea of nutrition, um, I'm like, that's mine, you know? I go, but I want to do it the way that I want to kind of envision doing this, you know? And so that's really been uh, uh, a, a blessing. And I have a, we have a team now. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I have a wonderful IBD-focused dietitian who now is with us full-time, uh, Kelly. Um, and she even uh, was able to uh, uh, do some magic. And now we have, for inpatients at Cedars, you can actually get an SED uh, uh, official menu uh, if you're an inpatient. So that's one of the, probably the few places in the world you can probably do that, but uh, that, 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 that's Kelly. Uh, and she's a phenomenal resource. So uh, this is for the, so the, for the uh, 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 handout I'm going to give later. Um, there will be a handout, so I'm going to give that to Jeffrey. Um, and so it'll, all the stuff will be in there. Uh, my slides can be a little bit busy, um, but I'm going to help you know, kind of focus in on, on what's there. So this is a question that, that I used to get sort of at the end of the conversation. Now I introduce it earlier in, in, in the thing, but like, you know, you're getting ready to walk out the room and the patient's like, oh, but a doctor, one more question. Does diet matter? And you're thinking, oh my gosh, that's like a half hour discussion at least, right? You know? So, um, and, and really, I mean, for this audience, it really should be flipped around. It's, you know, diet does matter uh, without the question mark. But if you go on the internet, you'll find everything from, you know, you shouldn't eat any fiber at all, to you should be a raw vegan, to you should go paleo. Um, but, you know, what do the doctors say? I, I imagine the number of you have heard doctors say diet doesn't matter. Um, uh, we had a, 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 a doctor rotating in from Spain with us for a couple months, and she walked out of the room and said, you gave specific advice on diet. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, but I mean, how do you know what to say? Because, you know, they're, they're, they, you know, there's no data. You know, that's what you hear a lot of people say. There's no data, so I can't give you specific advice. And, and I mean, that's a myth. We're going to, you know, uh, we already heard some of that, but I'll, I'll kind of expand on that some more. Other doctors will say, okay, well, maybe it can help with symptoms, but, you know, and really historically, the goals of uh, nutrition and IBD have been to optimize nutritional status, to prevent or treat malnutrition, to prevent kind of longer term complications, and to minimize uh, symptoms uh, that might uh, uh, you know, worsen with certain uh, foods. But in 2019 and beyond, we, what we really should be asking is, can diet and nutritional strategies be used therapeutically to reduce inflammation, to achieve remission, to reduce medication exposure, to reduce the risk of IBD relapse or maybe prevent it from coming back after surgery? How about to reduce cancer risk? or treat extraintestinal manifestations of IBD, things like mouth ulcers and joint pains. And I put little check marks here because I think those are all things that we can talk about now. So when a patient asks me, you know, what can I eat or what should I eat, does diet matter? I ask, well, why do you ask? You know, um, uh, what's your goal? Is it really for overall health? Is it to address your, or um, uh, avoid certain nutritional deficiencies that might happen? If a patient has an active disease, is it to target symptom control? Again, things like mouth ulcers, joint pain, stuff like that. Or is it for better disease control? That means actually getting the inflammation under control and maybe even getting rid of it. Um, and, and if someone's in remission and doing well, is it to maintain remission? Maybe prevent disease recurrence? Is it to try to de-escalate from some of the traditional medicines that they're on? Or is there some sort of other reason why they're doing that? Because the conversation is going to go based on what the patient is actually interested in. So why consider therapeutic nutrition? Um, you know, 
we kind of tend to think that we've got these amazing drugs and they're phenomenal, so why do we need to think about nutrition? But if you look at some of the bigger biologic studies and we look at response, response really means going from bad to better. We see about two thirds of individuals have a short term response. Um, and if we look at remission, remission is like feeling well in, in a simple sense. You know, longer term, about a third of patients actually do well in, you know, are, are, are in remission. So, um, you know, there's room for improvement. In the clinical trial studies tell us that the short term response, again, is about two thirds, and remission long term is about a third. Now, sustained remission off of steroids, we definitely have room for improvement. And we know that medicines can kind of wear off over time. In real life, though, outside of a study, we can sort of uh, adjust doses, we can blend therapies together, uh, yeah, add in other alternative things, stuff like that, but there's still cost issues and there's concerns about side effects and stuff like that. So obviously, you know, nutrition would seem like something that would be important to discuss and things outside of the realm of, of just traditional medicine. When do we consider nutrition? Well, when I was a fellow back in the late 90s, um, I read this article on rheumatology in a rheumatology journal and there was a, something called the therapeutic pyramid in, in the journal. So I thought, well, why don't I use that for IBD, you know, so I kind of made this pyramid and you can see that there's not a lot of stuff in there. Um, but, you know, fast forward to 2019, we have all these different therapies and we tend to kind of go from the bottom up, but, you know, it kind of depends on how sick somebody is and, and other circumstances and that's kind of being rethought now. But really, either surgery or nutrition, uh, depending on how sick somebody is and what's going on, can be applied at any point, you know, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the disease cycle. Disease affects nutritional status. So if you look at patients, for example, with Crohn's disease or colitis, both have inflammation. That may affect absorption. It may affect transit. That means how quickly things go through you. So even though small bowel absorption, and the nutritional absorption happens in the small intestine, when someone's got a bad UC flare, stuff still sort of flies through the intestines that way. Um, in Crohn's disease, you get narrowings. That might limit the amount or type of food that you can eat. And then fistula are like these deep ulcers that kind of burrow their way through the lining of the intestine into whatever's sitting next to it. Sometimes it's another piece of intestine. And so now you're kind of bypassing part of the intestine and kind of missing out on things that way. And really up to about 85% of uh, individuals can have some degree of malnutrition. And malnutrition impacts IBD. There's things like growth failure, weight loss, poor bone health, it affects inflammation, healing, response to medications, fatigue, depression, decreased quality of life. And there's been a whole bunch of micronutrient deficiencies that have been identified. While not focusing on, you know, like, give, uh, like a, a podium to one of them, but like vitamin D is something, the deficiency and insufficiency is something we see a lot. Uh, probably a good 85% of my patients are either vitamin D deficient or insufficient despite living in California, despite going out to the beach and surfing and stuff like that. Um, and many of them actually have osteoporosis too, uh, and, or osteopenia, up to 75% or so. And that's without even getting exposed to steroids. And then vitamin D deficiency can lead to lack of energy, depression, and stuff. There's some small studies that suggest that, you know, vitamin D is actually important for IBD. Um, there is a low vitamin D is, uh, uh, has been associated with an increased risk of developing Crohn's disease, um, an increased risk of disease activity has been associated with that, an increased risk of getting hospitalized or having surgery, uh, increased risk of, of colon cancer. And supplementing has been shown to reduce relapses of disease. So, um, yeah, I think something like vitamin D can actually be a very uh, important uh, part of things. Now, like I said, we have a, a nutrition and integrative IBD program, and we see patients, and they come in and they are expected to sort of uh, give us their goal for the visit before they show up, you know, which is kind of cool. Um, and about 60% come for symptom management, and about 40, 44% came for actual disease management. And there's a lot of overlap and and other things that people were looking for as well. But like 77% had never met with a dietitian before. 92% were avoiding at least one major food category. 40% three categories. And a lot of them either had identified nutrient deficiencies or at least get significant risk if they were gonna continue down the same road. Now, I like nutrition, so I came up with this IBD therapeutic menu, right? You have your starters like steroids and anti-inflammatories, traditional classic immunomodules like 6MP and azathioprine from methotrexate your featured items, the biologics, new items like tofacinumab, combo plates, which is you kind of combine all these things together. And we've got kids selections, senior selections, pregnancy specials, seasonal options like experimental drugs. Um, and then, you know, there's kind of like available in special locations, you know, and that's really 
you know, the uh, specialized diets. That's uh, not, not uh, you can't get that everywhere. Now, if you're looking at just sort of eating healthy, you know, then they recommend, you know, whole foods. You want to minimize processed foods. Um, uh, you know, kind of limit your sugars and, and, and bad fats. Limit red meat, alcohol. You know, really hydrate, pay attention to the labels. And, uh, uh, but what about for IBD, like in terms of symptom control? Uh, can, can diet affect symptom control? So common GI manifestations, gastrointestinal manifestations of, of IBD include nausea, abdominal pain, cramping, bloating, diarrhea, and constipation. And if you're flaring, then you know, cutting back on fiber, lowering your fat intake, lowering your lactose intake, and small frequent meals makes sense. But like low fiber isn't for life. I can't tell you how many patients I've seen who've had disease for 10 years who don't have any narrowings, who tell me that they're told they can't eat fiber, and I tell them, yes, you can grab a salad, and I'm like, yeah, like I just, you know, open the doors for them. It's like, wow, you know, it's really cool. But um, so, you know, whether these Crohn's or you see and kind of what's going on actually makes a difference there. Now, diet modifications can also help if you don't have active IBD, but you have IBD. So some people have these narrowings or strictures, and, or you have adhesions where you get mechanical issues, and, you know, altering the diet can be helpful that way. If things are just flying through you, um, uh, be it in the active disease or just because you have short bowel syndrome, for example, then there are dietary things you can do that will allow you to absorb your food better uh, and strategies and stuff like that. Gluten sensitivity, I think, is, is more common than, than, than we like to admit. But though celiac and IBD is actually pretty uh, unusual. We do have a few patients with that. A lot of people also have like irritable bowel syndrome uh, or lactose intolerance. And then there's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Do any of these symptoms sound familiar? Gassiness, bloating, cramping, urgency, sense of incomplete evacuation. Frequent loose stools, fatigue, heartburn, foggy brain, um, mouth ulcers, joint pains, and symptoms that get worse when you take carbohydrates or dairy, so we'll call lactose intolerance. Well, these are all symptoms of bacterial overgrowth, and they overlap a lot with IBD. It's sort of a constellation of symptoms. You don't have to have them all, but they often cycle. So people tend to have good days and bad days, whereas when you just have IBD going on, like a flare, it tends to be fairly consistent that way. And there is something you can do called a breath test where you can look for, for this. Uh, and what's very interesting is that there's a little line at the bottom over here that for many years I didn't know existed because we had a black and white printer and I used to get these printouts that way. And um, I didn't notice that line until we got the color printer and it was red and I go, oh my gosh, there's like no methane in these patients. So uh, very few patients with IBD actually have methane producing a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And actually if, if you were to ask me like what's the most common uh, most single most common non-IBD explanation for a good portion of people's symptoms with IBD, I would have to say is bacterial overgrowth. And so, you know, how do you treat that? I mean, this is kind of like my approach. So one approach is antibiotics. Uh, one approach would be probiotics. Um, uh, and, and this is actually taught to me by the patient who introduced me to SCD like 20 some odd years ago. Um, uh, and uh, uh, she used to get these recurrent episodes of bacterial overgrowth and then um, started taking probiotics and Voila, it didn't happen again uh, anymore. And then you can use diet, you know, so diet, you can use the low FODMAP diet, there's something called a SIBO diet, SCD certainly helps with that. As a matter of fact, if someone has SCD and IBD, um, they tend to respond faster, and if they cheat, they notice it faster. There's like this built-in feedback mechanism that other people who don't have uh, SIBO don't necessarily have uh, dramatically, certainly. And then you can use like uh, enteral nutrition, like Vivanex, something like that to get rid of that too. And then, you know, mouth ulcers are pretty common in IBD. Well, my, the patient who taught me about the probiotics uh, and introduced me to SCD would take the probiotic pill and rub it on the mouth ulcer and let it sit there for a few minutes a couple times a day. And instead of lasting for like a week or 10 days, they'd melt away within 24 to 36 hours. Pretty amazing. Now, she was using a different probiotic that was not SCD legal. Uh, I don't think the acidophilus was available at the time, but I've actually switched over to acidophilus for a lot of patients and find that it works just as well uh, for the majority of patients with mouth ulcers. The low FODMAP diet, Dr. Gold just mentioned that. This is a uh, kind of where you um, uh, avoid uh, a variety of different kinds of short chain uh, uh, sugars. Um, and it's used a lot for irritable bowel syndrome. They did a study in, in IBD. What they found though is that it didn't really affect the disease activity itself so it did help with things like diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating. And so this is something that um, you know, can be employed uh, for, for individuals. It's not really meant to be a, like a long-term kind of dietary intervention, but kind of more like to identify you know, what, what might be bothering you. 
and then to kind of reintroduce things uh, uh, slowly that way. Um, so it can help with symptoms, you know, which is important, but not necessarily with disease activity. And dietary insights can really be transformative. I mean, I'm, I'm already preaching to the choir here, but like um, we had a patient who, you know, I tried to get everybody seeing our dietitian uh, at least, you know, once. And this patient's like, you know, I'm, I'm Dr. V, you know, I've, I've had this, I've been eating like this for 30 years. You know, I know what bothers me, what doesn't. But so let's fast forward six months. She did visit with our dietitian and she started a low FODMAP diet. And she's like, wow, you know, I, I didn't realize how much garlic and onion bothered me until I stopped eating them completely. Uh, they're hidden in so many foods. So even like little amounts can, can, can make a difference. But can eliminating a specific food get rid of inflammation? like in celiac disease. Well, there was a study uh, where they looked at, uh, and they described, uh, these are patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, to see what foods might bother them, might aggravate their symptoms and make them better. And interestingly, uh, yogurt uh, improves symptoms. So, um, uh, so but, uh, you know, so, so people can identify things that bother them, but again, you know, does this really impact the disease? And so there was a study where they looked at this. They took patients, who could identify what bothered them, they took that out of their diet, they kind of sneakily reintroduced it to them, so it was kind of a placebo control thing, and some of them would get reproduced symptoms and others wouldn't. So they took the group that had reproducible symptoms, and they followed these patients over time, and then they followed a group of patients who didn't have any identifiable food issues, and they followed them over time, and what they found was there was really, and they had, the patients who had food sensitivities kept those things out of their diet, and what they found was that there was really no difference in disease activity and remission rates over time. So even if you can identify what bothers you, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna affect your inflammation. So studies show that eliminating a few identifiable foods or sort of simple restrictions uh, can help you feel better and improve symptoms, but doesn't really have a long-term impact on underlying disease. And yet we know that diet can impact IBD, um, and, and food can. Uh, you guys all know that. Um, but how do we explain this disconnect? You know, kind of what's the, what's the evidence? Well, exclusive enteral nutrition, or EEN, is when you get 100% of your nutritional needs from a formula. And there's different types of formulas. When it was first being used in IBD, it, it, they used elemental formulas, where everything was really broken down, kind of thinking, well, if we break it down, then the body's immune system won't react to it, you know, um, and, and maybe we can get inflammation to quiet down. And, and indeed, um, uh, it might, again, I did pediatrics, that it worked, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty cool, but you had to kind of give this to an NG tube, uh, and we'd have patients like sliding down NG tubes at night and then pulling them out in the evening and, and uh, I mean, as part of their normal life. And they would actually ask to go on it because they hated steroids, you know, so um, we would sometimes cycle people through things. But if you ever smell Vivanex, it smells foul, okay? And they have these flavor packets. It's like, you know, yeah, it's the flavor packets. Um, and it doesn't smell that good either. So, um, so then we thought, they thought, well, how about looking at things that are semi-elemental or sort of broken down to taste better? And they found that that actually can work just as well as, uh, as uh, the, the, the elemental formula. And now there's some polymeric or kind of just regular formulas um, like Boost and Sure and some organic ones like Organ and Vegan like Kate Farms. So there's lots of different kinds of formulas now and they can induce remission and improvement in symptoms. Uh, and it doesn't really matter that it's all broken down for a lot of people, and maybe in some individuals it still might matter. There was a study where they looked at exclusive enteral nutrition, and they wanted to know, you know, if you give it through an NG tube, uh, is it any different than just drinking it? Um, and uh, um, so they did a study, and they found that the remission rate on both was pretty similar. Oral was about 75%, and NG was about 85%. Now, this is remission in the sense of the symptoms are gone. You know, it, it really wasn't looking at, you know, deep remission that way. So people are about feeling better. And this is a formula called, called modulin. So now there's levels of remission. So there's, people ask me, what is remission? So clinical remission is when you feel well. And, and that really is, when you look at older studies, that's kind of the, the end point that they use, you know, just sort of feeling well. There's sort of a biochemical remission, and, and they use it a lot in a lot of newer studies. That's things like your blood inflammation markers, your sed rate, your CRP, are you anemic or not? And then there's stool inflammatory markers like calprotectin. And then they, they, they go down when, you, when, when the inflammation goes away. And then there's endoscopic remission. That's really becoming more the new standard. You know, you look inside, you want to see the inflammation gone. Um, and then there's something called histologic remission, which is like, we call that deep remission. Like there's no inflammation in on the microscope. And that would be sort of like uh, the ideal thing, I think, to, to shoot for. Um, so can exclusive ventral nutrition induce actual mucosal healing on the inside? 
And there was a study where they found that after eight weeks of doing this formula called Modulin, that 79% of these children and teenagers were in clinical remission after eight weeks, and a certain portion of them actually had mucosal healing too. Um, and this is just one of my patients who's an adult, 30 years old, uh, where she had surgery, inflammation came back, she'd been on a whole bunch of different biologic drugs with either partial or, si or response or side effects, didn't really take care of things. Started on a vitalizumab, which is like Intivio, it's one of the newer drugs, drugs out there. Seven months later, more symptoms, was put on budesonide, you know, set rate, CRP her up, and she just wanted something different. So um, we started her on enteral nutrition in the form of Ensure. Five months later, we scoped her and she's in deep remission and her set rate's normal, her CRP is normal, she feels great, the pathology came back normal. You know, so that was, uh, that's pretty cool. So exclusive enteral nutrition, you know, um, has fewer side effects than steroids. They've compared exclusive enteral nutrition with corticosteroids. And some of the earlier studies suggested that exclusive nutrition might actually be better, but it, when you kind of pull everything together, it seems like it's, uh, it's about the same, but steroids may do a little bit better in, in, in the short run. But there's fewer side effects, plus, you get mucosal healing with it, which you don't get with steroids actually, and it can be used as part of a maintenance therapy, um, and you can get weight gain and, and nutrition into somebody. And, and actually in Europe, they will recommend often the, uh, the uh, enteral nutrition instead of steroids, uh, at least for adults with, uh, with IBD. Um, and then there's this really fascinating study where they found that they looked at 90 children with active Crohn's disease, and some of them got uh, anti-TNF therapy, you know, like Remicade, Mira, stuff like that. Some have got exclusive enteral nutrition, and some got partial enteral nutrition, where they get part of their formula, uh, their diet, their calories from formula. And they found that, that the EN was just as effective as anti tnf therapy, you know, at, at week eight. So, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then there was another study where they were looking at these patients, with the adults, uh, who were going to go to surgery, because they either had stricturing disease or they had penetrating disease that was really bad inflammation. And so they put these 51 adults on enteral nutrition, and 94% of them tolerated it well. But probably the most astounding part of the study was that 25% improved and no longer required surgery. They weren't expecting that. Um, it also sort of downstaged the need for an urgent surgery, so then the patients were in a better condition and better nutritional status, so that when they did have surgery, it was more of a semi-elective, safer kind of thing, and they did better, those fewer post-op complications. And in fact, now we pretty much at Cedars, we insist that, that our patients are gonna have surgery when we have time to do that, meet with a dietitian, because there are things you can do nutritionally that will boost things up and get patients out of the hospital faster with less complications, it's called ERAS. Um, and then there's partial, uh, sorry, well, what are some of the downsides of ventral exclusive ventral nutrition? Well, um, I mean, uh, well, first, the roles, I guess. So we can induce uh, symptomatic remission and possibly mucosal healing. Um, is great for people with strictures. Uh, it can be abridged until another medicine kind of works instead of, say, steroids. Um, you can avoid surgery. Uh, you can avoid uh, surgery sometimes or make it semi-elective or safer. It can be used to treat SIBO and, there's, it's, and, and avoid steroids. And it's pretty easy to do. You just pop open a can and, and, and you're good to go. Some limitations. It can be monotonous. Um, it doesn't necessarily taste all that good because you just want to do like one formula and not kind of alter it around. Um, it can alter stool consistency, be pretty expensive, not always covered by insurance. Um, there's a lack of familiarity in buying by medical professionals, and it really can't be combined with SCD because there are different paradigms. You know, uh, uh, there's uh, these commercial formulations that have starches and emulsifiers and thickeners, so this doesn't quite, quite match. Um, they're just different approaches to things. Um, and they can really be sustain challenging to sustain longer, but the biggest thing is once you start eating a regular food again, then the inflammation comes back. So we got a problem, you know? So um, it's good for induction, but, but not long-term. What about partial enteral nutrition? Well, this is when the nutrition, the formula provides about 30 to 50% of the calories, and the rest comes from real foods, hopefully, you know, uh, uh, good types of uh, foods. So they looked at partial enteral nutrition in maintaining remission of Crohn's disease, and they found that, that it can work. You know, it can, it can work better than just eating or regular food if you kind of, everything else is, is equal. And there's this interesting study in Japan where they took, uh, looked at 51 patients who were in remission. Now, to get them into remission, some got uh, infliximab or Remicade, some got prednisone, but some got intravenous nutrition and some got enteral nutrition, which is pretty cool, you know? So now they get into remission and they follow them for over two years. And so the group that um, received uh, enteral nutrition, um, partial enteral nutrition, only had about, a, only about a third of them relapsed compared to those on kind of on a free-range diet, 
60% relapsed. You know, so, so just doing the formula you know, for like one of your meals plus a little snack or something can actually help reduce the likelihood of, 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 of Crohn's flaring up. Uh, pretty cool. Now many have made a combination therapy for IBD. That's where we combine sort of a biologic drug with some sort of traditional immunosuppressive drug to kind of try to get more of an effect out of it, have it work in more patient numbers of patients, larger percentage. Um, and uh, this kind of, there, for a long time, that was kind of like the, the, the way we had to do things. But there's a, a couple studies now that look at combination therapy in the sense of partial insulin nutrition and infliximab or Remicade. And what they found was that the people on the combination therapy, right, combining nutrition and the drug, the biologic, did better than patients on monotherapy. There was actually a two-fold increase in achieving clinical remission uh, by doing that, and that effect was sustained beyond the end of the study. Uh, so again, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Now, individuals with Crohn's disease who go on to have surgery, uh, the inflammation comes back, you know, uh, if you just sort of uh, eat regular food and stuff like that and go on no medication. So there's a study here, um, and what we see is that the um, symptoms occur faster than the actual en endoscopic stuff uh, happens. So if you look inside, you can actually see things before um, someone actually gets symptoms, often precedes it by a good you know, year or so. But after about three years, up to 100% of people actually have recurrent inflammation if you look inside. So it's, it's a pretty high recurrence rate. Uh, so the conclusion is that without medication and on a regular diet, Crohn's comes back. And if you look at longer term, so this wait and treat, you know, wait and see kind of a, a thing, 89% of patients will go on to have a second surgery if you don't do something different. You know, so um, uh, you know it's a, it, it's it's a real issue. So you want to be proactive. And so there was a study where they looked at giving partial enteral nutrition to individuals, and others ate sort of a regular diet after surgery. And the group that um, uh, uh, was eating a regular diet had a 70% recurrence rate compared to only 30% on partial enteral nutrition. So again, simple modification, and you can really have a longer term impact on things. So partial enteral nutrition really has a role um, in boosting caloric intake. Uh, you can use it in really sick patients, and people are malabsorbing, say from rapid transit, short bowel syndrome, inflammation, uh, can't eat because they don't feel good or they got strictures. Uh, it can help prolong remission, um, may delay or reduce the likelihood of, of, of postoperative Crohn's recurrence, and can actually boost the efficacy of these biologic drugs. You know, so again, that's uh, pretty cool. So is there a real food option? Uh, let's look at remission first. So there was an interesting study um, uh, that, uh, published not too long ago, uh, earlier this year, where they looked at, um, it's called the, the, the um, uh, tree study, and what they, what they did here was they, they said, well, exclusive under nutrition works, in, at least in kids, you know, um, and, and it can work in adults too. So what they did was they tried to simulate this formula with ordinary food. Um, so the formula usually is supposed to simulate good nutrition you get from real food, but okay, anyways. So, um, and, and what they did though is that because a lot of formulas contain maltodextrin, maltodextrin, which is like an artificial glucose polymer, and really is, uh, uh, they replaced that with high starch and low fiber. Um, and, uh, but what they found was that, that it, it did actually change the microbiome just like EN did. It reduced gut inflammation in, in the, in the in, in the study, that they, it was a very complex study. Um, it was well tolerated and it had the potential for helping uh, individuals with active Crohn's disease. So it's actually kind of you know, cool that way. And, and there was five uh, kids that they actually went and it, so the, the study was complicated and they, uh, but the, the part where they actually did it in humans, um, they looked at five kids and, and, um, uh, and, and what we see here is that after eight weeks, their symptoms actually got better. This, you can see the symptom score drop here over the course of the eight weeks. And a lot of them actually um, had reductions in their calprotectin. But if you look at the uh, sort of cutoff here, these are the calprotectins up here. The cutoff for calprotectin mean normal is way down here. So even though these individuals felt good, there's still an inflammation going on inside. Um, and so uh, they really failed to achieve deep remission just with the short therapy. Now it may just be that they weren't on it long enough or maybe we need to kind of you know, find a little different approach. And then there's the SCD diet, which you guys are all familiar with. Um, this is one of those things where um, uh, kind of warning like this is what SCD foods look like, right? Um, and then you got your SCD legal foods, which I think are really a real food healthy alternative type of diet. Um, and my, my uh, uh, the slide, the, the 
thing I was kind of the, the slide program I was kind of putting up beforehand. Analog pictures come from this book. I'm busted. Um, I, uh, but it's used for educational purposes only. So, uh, but you know, it's, it's actually pretty cool because when I uh, when I give a talk on on diet, I'll, I'll actually put up that sort of a slide thing ahead of time. And then when someone goes, usually it's a doctor says, "How can you make patients go on such a restricted diet and expect them to be on it?" And then I'm like, you know, all those foods you guys were looking at and salivating over before the whole thing started. I'm salivating right now, getting hungry. Um, I go, those are all acid illegal foods. They're like, but but there was bread there. I go, I know. There was like, you know, muffins there. I go, I know. There's like ice cream. It's like I know. So um, it's a it's a healthy alternative. Uh, but again, compliance is important, and, and there's like hidden things like aloe vera, which we'll talk about more tomorrow. Uh, we are kind of already went over, Dr. Go went over the, the pediatric study, um, and so I'm going to kind of skip over that, other than to say that, um, uh, you know, we, we did see improvement in all the parameters, and it was actually pretty cool, um, and they actually saw microbial changes in things too uh, uh, over time. Um, there was a survey of adult, mostly adult patients. Uh, with IBD on SCD, and they found that um, you actually got symptomatic remission fairly quickly in this group of patients, but it wasn't really assessed endoscopically, but it happened pretty quickly. Symptoms got better, you know, so that's some additional proof that it, that it can work. But the big question then is like mucosal healing, you know. Um, can you go on the diet and actually heal on the inside? Um, and so there was a small study by Dr. Susskind's group, um, and what we find is that only one of the patients actually achieved mucosal healing. And you go, well, that's kind of disappointing. The patients have been on the diet for like 13 months, even over a year in, in some cases. But if you look at the SCD over here, it was modified specific carbohydrate diet, okay? And that's in the title actually too, modified. Um, and so um, I think that's what makes a difference. Um, and. Uh, So patients know that I harp on that. So I, we had this one uh, individual uh, who was hospitalized with really bad uh, colitis. It's technically indeterminate. You know, 10 bowel movements a day, getting up at night, pain, weight loss, colonoscopy, so severe inflammation throughout the entire colon. Got a, went on IV steroids, got better, went on prednisone, but she's still symptomatic. Comes to meet with uh, us and our dietitian, starts on SCD, rapid improvement in symptoms, got off of steroids a little bit faster than I generally like to do that, but she did. Um, two months later, she comes into the office sticking strictly to SCD, saying, I feel worlds better, and it's awesome. Um, and she says, you know, I, I just feel like I'm in a totally different place right now. And so she's down to two, bowel, two to three bowel months a day, no more blood, no more urgency, working out again. And four months later, she stopped her background medication, which was just like an, an, an anti-inflammatory. So she comes in for a colonoscopy 16 months after starting an SCD diet, and I asked, you know, how do you feel? She goes, great. I go, and how's the diet going? Now at this point, when I ask most patients, I get one or two answers, right? Either I've been super strict, Dr. V, or I get pretty good. And I go, what does pretty good mean? Um, well, I stick to it like I did it really great for about six months, and then, you know, I went to this party, I had something, it didn't really bother me, and you know, I know you said, but I'm kind of different, you know, and 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 so um, I know in that patient that I'm going to see inflammation. Okay, it, it, it's just a, it's just, a, it's just, a, it's just a given. If I'm doing the scope at around a year, um, and so then you know I see inflammation, and I come out and say, you know, let's talk about some of these medications. They're like, but Dr. V, um, I was really struck. I, I know I can do this. I was really good for the first six months. Can I please just give it another year? I'm a softy. I usually say yes, and then you know we usually get, we get a much better response at that point. So I share that up front with patients ahead of time now. Those experiences, so they don't do that. Um, and it, it does help. But in this individual, I mean, she had horrible colitis. It's all gone, you know? And the biopsy came back normal, too. So adherence to strict SED really optimizes the chance of getting and achieving deep remission, though it can take a year and a half to two years for that to actually happen. So if you scope someone at a year on SED, they may feel good, the inflammation markers may be fine, the calprotectin may be normal, you look inside, you still see inflammation. So don't stop it too early. You really want to get to the point where there's no inflammation. That takes minimal year and a half to two years. And then you probably want to pass point it back beyond that. So, um, and so literally that means no cheating at all, not even a wee little bit. Um, and where do you go from there? That's going to be the big question that we'll talk about a little bit, maybe in the question and answer session. Now the actual studies on, on SCD are a little bit limited, really overall include small numbers of patients. 
Um, most of them don't really use objective uh, endoscopic healing measures. There's a couple that do. Uh, and they're relatively short-term duration. Um, and, and most don't control, uh, have a placebo control. Why is placebo important? Because if you look at a Crohn study where you got really sick patients and say a biologic therapy, 20 to 50% of patients actually get placebo effect and get better with that. So to really say that a therapy is working, you want to show that it's better than placebo. There's also not too many doctors and, and, and dietitians who are experts you know, in, in SCD, and even fewer that have longer term experience with that. And there's no consensus on like, okay, so I'm feeling well, now what? My thing would be, I want endoscopic proof. you know. Um, and if you're in deep remission, where do you go from here? Um, and uh, uh, so for example, I, I saw this one 17-year-old uh, uh, with, with bad colitis who really didn't want to go on medications. She went on SCD, she got better. I mean, her inflammation markers got normal. She's actually feeling great. You know, she's getting ready to go off to college. I scope her and she's got this like a little bit of inflammation on the rectum. Everything else went really good, you know? And mother's like, so can we stop SCD or kind of back off from that? And then the girl looks over at her mom, she goes, mom, didn't you hear Dr. V? He said, I have embers of inflammation still. He goes, you know, the diet was really hard in the beginning because I'm used to it now. I can do this. I want to do this. And so she's actually, this is a 17-year-old, you know, saying, hey, mom, you know, this is what I want to do. It was pretty cool. What about diet to maintain remission? So um, uh, they did a study looking again at this, you know, we talked about the study about the post-op prophylaxis. So that's, that's actually pretty cool. But is there a real food option? Well, it turns out that um, uh, they did a study looking at semi-vegetarian diet as, as maintenance of remission. So they took patients on a semi-vegetarian diet, and the only other medicines they were on were uh, mesalamine or sulfasalazine, 5 sa drugs, which a lot of dark doctors will say don't work for IBD. So then you either have to say that diet works or it was the medicine, but uh, that's another issue. Um, and, and the outcome was really lack of symptoms. So they followed patients for two years. Look at the difference in clinical remission rate. The ones on the semi-vegetarian diet, 92% were still in remission. The ones who were on an omnivorous free-range diet, only 25% were in remission. And that's with real food. And then there's SCD. And of course, we don't have any data on that, although I have a lot of patients who pursue that as a maintenance therapy in various forms, and we can certainly uh, discuss that more later. So what I've shown you is that nutrition can modulate symptoms and inflammation in, in, in IBD in a variety of different ways. So does diet matter? The answer, it really is a resounding yes. So, um, but why? You know, what, what is it about it? So uh, if we look at uh, the very, you know, the theory of IBD, you have genetic predisposition, the immune system's a little bit off, and there's an interplay then with the environment, which includes your gut bacteria, infection, smoking, diet, and things like that. Um, but there's something in the food, obviously, that we're eating that can influence infl in, in, in inflammation. Now, is it that it's being stimulating something in the immune system uh, directly? And, and that's really what the intravenous nutrition and the, uh, you know, the enteral nutrition and uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, other types of things you know, look at some of the vegetarian diet and stuff like that. Is it food additives? Uh, is it the gut microbiome? Uh, is it epigenetic triggering? What that is is that the turning on and off of genes, specific genes, through the interaction of the environment, which in the gut is going to be, you know, food can, can, it be, can be a trigger, stress, smoking, bacteria, and, and fungi. All right, let's look at food additives. This looks pretty harmless, right? Seaweed extract. Well, some are going to say, well, that's uh, carrageenan, you know, which is like an emulsifier and a thickener stabilizer that they use in all these different wonderful foods that people eat. Well, they published a study a while back where they showed that carrageenan in uh, rats can actually induce inflammation. You can create an experimental model of IBD giving these, these rats carrageenan. Um, and then people said, well, but you, that doesn't really, you know, it's not been proven to be effective. Like, that, that doesn't happen in real people, right? You know, that's just a mouse model kind of thing. Well, they did a study uh, in patients with ulcerative colitis who were in remission. And they um, put them on a no carrageenan diet. So everybody was on a no carrageenan diet. diet and then they gave carrageenan capsules of 100 to 200 milligrams a day, which is a little bit less than your average intake of the average person of 250 milligrams a day. And they assessed them every two weeks for a year. And these patients you know, completed questionnaires. Well, the three patients who were getting carrageenan, uh, three of the patients getting the carrageenan capsules over here, 
flared over that time. Uh, and their disease got worse. Whereas the group that uh, 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 didn't, uh, uh, you know, was on the placebo where they weren't getting the carrageenan, actually there was no change there at all. So again, this is intriguing. And the authors actually concluded that carrageenan intake may contribute to earlier relapse of, of, uh, of disease in patients with ulcerative colitis and remission that maybe we should be thinking about restricting that. Now there's lots of other emulsifiers and thickeners. There's these things called microparticles and nanoparticles. And uh, TISO, um, uh, uh, which is found in things like toothpaste and stuff like that, actually is used as a way to worsen this, again, this IBD model of colitis. You know, so um, you know, the, the, the jury is out, but it's certainly uh, intriguing. Uh, now there's gonna be sort of whole talks on the microbiome, but the microbiome in, in, in IBD, Crohn's and UC, uh, Crohn's and UC, and healthy individuals is all different. Um, and um, uh, you know, so the, the gut does play a role in things. As a matter of fact, if you take mice that are genetically predisposed to develop IBD and you don't expose them to bacteria before they're, you know, right after they're born, they don't, they don't develop IBD. They're normal until you introduce the bacteria. Then they get the, the inflammation. If you take different genetic mice and you expose them to the same bacteria, one might get minimal inflammation and one might be very inflamed. If you take the same genetic mice with a predisposition and you grow in a germ-free environment, uh, it won't develop inflammation. If you give it one type of bacteria, it gets mild inflammation. If you give it a different type of bacteria, it actually gets really severe inflammation. So the bacteria definitely play a role here. And there was this pediatric study in, 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 in a, um, uh, where they gave this formula modulin to these uh, kids. And what they found was that the kids, you know, they got better pretty quickly over here. They actually went into remission relatively fast. But they looked at their microbiome too. And what they found was that the microbiome shift happened dramatically within a couple, within like two weeks. And then when they switched over to partial internutrition after a while, then the, 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 that, that wasn't quite as noticeable anymore, but it was still there, you know, so that was kind of, that was kind of interesting. And then there's studies showing that SCD also, you know, can, 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 can clearly affect the uh, microbiome. There's this really neat study done in Russia, and you could probably just do this in Russia, because it's called the Mars 500 experiment. So uh, Russian Academy of Sciences, so they, they took um, volunteers and they put them in an isolated module for 510 days, okay? Because uh, they really want to sort of study, you know, the, the psychological and physical effects of, of doing that. And then they, they, they looked at the, their bacterial composition over that time period. And within two to four weeks, the ch their microbiome changed dramatically, okay? So, you know, fast forward 510 days, now they get out into the real world again. And what they found was within two weeks, their microbiome had reverted almost to where it started all over again, you know? So, um, not quite, but, but almost. So, after resuming their old habits, that is diet and lifestyle, then their inflammation came back. So what if, um, so, so the lesson here is that if you choose sort of a shorter term diet-like approach to IBD, right, um, say EN or, or short-term SED, you may or will likely see short-term results. But if you go back to your old habits and your usual diet and lifestyle, then that effect or benefit may revert back towards where you originally started. Um, that's just something to really think about. Now, there's a number of studies that show that smoking can affect the microbiome, the exercise can affect the microbiome, diet can affect the microbiome, stressors can affect the microbiome, and sleep deprivation can affect the microbiome. These are all lifestyle things, right? And so, um, now, yeah, the question, other question would be, is it, is it the microbiome or is it kind of this epigenetic stuff going on, or probably a combination of both, right? But what if, instead of kind of going back to your usual, you know, diet and habits, you actually then kind of opt for a longer-term dietary and lifestyle modification? Might that actually have a longer-lasting impact on things, and might you then actually change the natural history of your IBD? And I think that's something worthwhile, you know, thinking about. So I really advocate for lifelong and longer-term lifelong positive changes in, in lifestyle overall, and I'll talk about that a lot more tomorrow. So who do we consider it in? Um, you know, Dr. Zeus pediatricians, I don't know, he's got the tie over there with the Dr. Zeus stuff on it. So, you know, I came up with this list and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, it sounds like I'm reading Greg Nags and him, right? You know, this and this and that. So you can use it to address uh, identified deficiencies. For those who are already avoiding super, certain foods, to be proactive to avoid future problems, to be in remission, if you're in remission, that, you know, uh, but still have symptoms. If you have symptoms that are out of proportion to what we're actually seeing, if you're hospitalized with a flare, um, yeah, people who want to just overall improve their, you know, their, their, their health. People who want a more natural approach to managing their IBD. 
um, as a way, you know, people who are concerned about medication side effects, as a way to maybe minimize sort of stronger medications. Um, uh, you, you know, people who want to use it as adjunctive therapy for, or, or primary therapy for, for preventing post-op complications and, and disease recurrence. For people who are already in remission, and as an adjunct for people who want to de-escalate or, or back off therapy instead of just stopping everything, maybe we can do this in a more thoughtful uh, way to give yourself a better chance. So, in fact, almost everybody's a potential candidate for nutritional therapy. You can do it at any age. I've, I've uh, um, uh, you know, help people in, who are very, you know, like still in their pre-teens with, uh, with SCD and up to 80-something, you know, and, uh, um, and, and I, I probably help or, you know, walk through or guided or, or kind of been on the journey with over 200 patients with SCD. So it's, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty cool. Um, and, but the therapeutic distribution choice will depend on, you know, the patient's goals, the phase of their disease, um, you know, life circumstances at the time, and the level, level of motivation um, and determination of the patient and the support they have at home. Uh, so the best candidates are those that are willing and eager to be actively engaged in their health. But there are some concerns about using real diets, right? These are the doctor's concerns. Uh, uh, you know, there's lack of control data, uh, so people are sort of reluctant to recommend it. There's a concern about weight loss because of it's a restrictive diet. Um, there's the um, uh, you know, delaying appropriate therapy. Uh, uh, there's nutritional deficiency concerns, especially if you do something longer term, right? Um, people say, well, you'll feel better if you go on the diet, but you know, what about the active disease? So, uh, and then just the lack of familiarity with these concepts in, in physicians and dietitians. And there are some things you have to worry about with SCD if you do it long term. You have to worry about vitamin D and E and some B vitamins and calcium. And these are all things you can proactively deal with um, and get uh, you know, appropriate SCD legal supplements uh, for. And we do monitor a variety of labs uh, in patients every six months or so uh, who kind of go this uh, long term. So how do we effectively incorporate this into someone's regimen? So you need a thoughtful strategy. A doctor would never write, Here's uh, infliximab or Remicade, you know, take it at week zero, two, and six, and then take it every eight weeks, and I'll give you a year's worth of refills and come and see me in a year, you know? Um, but that's what we do with diet recommendations. It just it makes no sense at all. Kind of go figure it out on your own kind of thing. So that's really not the way to go. So if you want to do it thoughtfully, it needs to be done in a nutritionally sound way, ideally medically supervised or partnered at least. Um, it's not for everybody because you need to be motivated. You can't sort of do it. It's just like sort of taking your medication. It doesn't give you the end result that you're looking for. Um, ideally, we, we want to try to find a good support system in place. When we have people come in for our, our nutrition counseling sessions, we actually ask them to bring in their significant other, be it a parent or a spouse or you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, or whatever, uh, because that's really going to make, uh, they, they need to understand that too to kind of make it happen. Ideally, you want to partner with someone who, you know, IB, you know like a GI doctor or, or, or diet, and or dietitian who actually is IBD focused. I know those are few and far in between. Uh, and there's a learning curve for everybody, you know, with, uh, with a diet. You want to monitor things. You want to do it long enough, just like you want to take, if you're going to use steroids, you need to use them for a long enough period of time. Biologics, you need to use them for a long enough period of time. You can't cheat on these diets and expect it to work. Um, I kind of harp on that again. Um, you want to set expectations. Um, uh, Dr. Gold mentioned that as well. And not just assess uh, symptomatic improvement, okay? People who go on a... Uh, 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 no processed food diet and cut out their um, you know, grains and stuff like that, almost all of them will feel better. Um, many of them will see improvements in their blood parameters. A lot of them will see improvements in their calprotectin. Um, and so there's this misperception that if your calprotectin is normal, there's no inflammation in there, but um, uh, you can definitely have inflammation. So there's something about removing those things from the diet that gets rid of those inflammation marker stimulators, but you can still have inflammation without that actually being there. Um, and I, I can't, I guess, overemphasize that. You wanna do something that's sustainable but doesn't necessarily need to be forever. Um, and um, uh, it's really not a diet, it's, just, it's a lifestyle change. And you may need to approach a strategy and likely will you know, over time. We need to address barriers. There's a really steep learning curve. There's hidden ingredients. We need strategies for you know, how to work and, and eat out, because there's a lot of planning involved, so how to go to social functions and maneuver those, uh, family gatherings, different cultural practices. I got people of all different ethnicities doing SCD. Uh, there's travel considerations. You can actually, if you do EN or SCD, you can get a letter from your doctor. We have some uh, of those uh, uh, that, you know, to, take, to get your stuff through uh, you know, security there. Uh, snack ideas are important, I think, too. Uh, 
uh, to try to get people to stay compliant. And uh, right now, there's still a sort of a lack of accessible resources. It requires a lot of time and preparation. There's the cost issue, but there is for everything. Um, what about logistics for success? So we try to set it up in, at our institution where you have like a dedicated counseling session, and we encourage follow-up visits. We actually provide people with pens and, and, and paper. You'd be amazed how many people come in and want to like talk to us, and they don't write anything down. And I'm thinking, how are you going to remember all this? You know. So that's why we started, you know, uh, doing that. Um, we talk about how to avoid potential nutritional deficiencies, kind of what supplements to take and where to get them. Uh, suggestions not only on what not to eat, but what you can eat. So many people come in and they're like restricting themselves to this like small amount of stuff because they're not really sure what they, they haven't done the research, you know? And so we try to like broaden things out because you want it to be sustainable again, you know, over time. We really harp on making sure that all supplements are SED legal. We talk about hidden ingredients, uh, including the natural flavorings. I heard yesterday that a natural flavoring includes sugar, um, I think, uh, you know, in, in, in one of the uh, 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 alcoholic beverages. Uh, and we actually provide handouts, shopping guides, website suggestions, book suggestions. I have people just take their iPhone and take a picture of all the books we have there, you know, uh, uh, in addition to kind of giving them links and stuff like that. And then uh, we talk about, you know, web-based patient support groups like the one you guys are all a part of. Um, and um, also talk about, for those who are kind of struggling with weight loss, because for some people that's a real issue, we talk about ways to kind of boost calories in an SED compliant uh, fashion. Uh, and then at CEDARS, we also have the inpatient menu if someone happens to get hospitalized. And then presentation matters, right? So I, I, we, we had this, uh, there was a Crohn's and Colitis Foundation conference happens once a year now. And so, um, you know, uh, in, in this last year, um, uh, there was actually a whole workshop on nutrition. It was like the first time they'd really done that. And uh, my dietitian actually was part of the organizing committee, so I had a chance to kind of uh, participate in that too. Um, and you have people who believe in SCD doctor-wise, right? Still calling it a restrictive diet. And I'm thinking, how are you gonna sell that? You know, like to other physicians and dietitians and stuff like that, if you call it a restrictive diet, why don't we just call it a healthy, real food alternative, you know? And, um, <laughs> Because that's really what it is. Um, all right, predictors of response. So I think if you're gonna pursue SCD, I really encourage doing a formal intro diet. I think that can make a big difference for a lot of people. Even if you're doing a feeling okay, I think it sort of resets everything for you. Kind of puts you in the right place. It's kind of like when you move into a new apartment, you maybe do sort of a preliminary cleaning before you start putting all your stuff in there. Um, compliance is critical. You can't cheat because you're cheating yourself. Um, and, 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 and the potential for what it can do. And I find that people call, fall into two categories. There's those that ultimately embrace SCD, and then there's those that continue to struggle with it, kind of thinking, oh, I need to do more work. You know, but um, uh, it, it can work for either. You know, a lot of willpower is involved, but the ones that embrace it uh, do tend to, to do better that way. Does it need to be continued forever? What have we learned from EEN and IBD? So if you do EEN for a few months, you can get symptom relief, you can improve your inflammation markers, you can alter your microbiome, you can get clinical remission in many, mucosal healing in some, but when you discontinue that and go back to regular stuff, the disease comes back again. Symptoms recur, the disease recurs. It's kind of like stopping steroids too soon. You haven't really achieved your ultimate goal. So the question then becomes, can we do it longer than three months? But that's gonna be really hard to do. You're not eating anything at all except for a formula. It's just really hard to do for a lot of people. So you need an exit strategy, you know, um, whether it's, it's EEN or SCD. For example, with, you might want to use it as a bridge to a medication, maybe something that's not quite as, you know, uh, scary, you know, uh, uh, you know, looking like, say, like a, like a, a 5-AC, like a mesalamine or azacol or pentacid or something like that. Um, maybe you're going to transition to partial nutrition and sort of a really healthy diet. Maybe transition into SCD. Or maybe add in things like vitamin D and turmeric and stuff like that to kind of optimize the chance of doing well in the long run. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. What about weaning off SCD? I think my, my key message would be don't stop or get lax too soon. Um, you know, really wait for that mucosal healing. You want to see true deep remission looking at it um, on biopsies. And then if you're really in deep, in, you know, deep remission, I would personally wait a good another half year to a year before I start mucking around with things, um, just to kind of make sure you sort of pass point everything. Um, 
I would probably stay on it, you know, but uh, uh, not everyone's willing to do that. And then um, you want to, um, uh, you'll have more flexibility if you're still on medications. So people who decide to do this without any medicine at all, uh, they do them, they're going to be stricter. They can't broaden things out as much if they decide to do that. People who are on really strong medicines, uh, like or biologists, can can often broaden things out, you know, a little more. Um, you want to monitor for early signs of recurrence, looking at labs and inflammation stuff like that. So even though the calprotectin may be normal, it is something that's often the first thing to go up. Um, and uh, I always recommend scoping after a year if you stop any sort of therapy, just to make sure that you catch something that's coming back early, or at least people are sure that you're doing the right thing, um, even if you're feeling well. And I do believe that SCD allows people to, in many cases, avoid steroids, avoid immunosuppressive drugs, biologic drugs, um, and, uh, or at least minimize that instead of using really, you know, combination things, you can get away with less of that. And a lot of people can eventually taper off their medications, at least taper down to much lower dose on things, uh, and still do and, and feel well. So I think the message is here, there's certain things we can't control, right? There's the called non-modifiable. That's your age your ethnicity, your, and, uh, your genetics, and your gender. Um, and then there's things that are modifiable, like eating healthy and mindfully, getting enough sleep, exercise, stress management strategies, your social network and support, and spirituality. And um, those are all things that uh, you know, we'll be talking about tomorrow. So I'm going to kind of finish off with, uh, I, you know, I got someone, uh, my, my niece kind of got me into Pinterest a while back, so I kind of put this food equals medicine Pinterest board. And these are just a couple quotes from that, but I want to you know, thank you really for your attention. And um, I'm a little bit of an introvert, even though um, I, I get up here and talk and stuff like that. And so my goal this year is to become a little more extrovert in, in my approach to things. So uh, I, I really do want to learn from you guys and would be delighted if you came up and kind of you know, gave me any sort of insights or pearls that I can take back and help with my patients. Thank you.